Welcome to our panel today. Uh, it's a great pleasure for us uh, to see you in our panel. And today we will be holding a final title track to diplomacy, the way out in Eastern Mediterranean, the solution is in diplomacy, which we will organize with the cooperation of the Europe Policy uh, Magazine and also the Eastern Mediterranean Policy Association with the main sponsorship of Merit Royal Diamond Hotels. The purpose of today's a panel is to facilitate dialogue and also promote the mutual understanding among the communities uh, in Cyprus through uh, track to diplomacy uh, and also the purpose of our panel explore alternative diplomatic approaches and seek find a resolution to the challenge faced in the Eastern Mediterranean region. Uh, at the end of our panel, it's aimed to create a platform for discussing and also negotiating and researching uh, the conflict issues in the Mediterranean, uh, Eastern Mediterranean, and also Cyprus. For this purpose, in the first phase of our project, we will tackle uh, the complex geopolitical problems uh, in the region based on the past experiences of our distinguished uh, speakers, and uh, also focus on how to find a solution uh, through the diplomatic means. Now, uh, I would like to give uh, briefly uh, information about the format and duration of the panel. Uh, each of our panelists will have a speaking time of uh, 50 minutes speaking time. And also, um, just question after that, uh, if when the old speakers uh, finish their speech, we will start, just we will have 10 minutes uh, coffee break time. After that, we will start question and answer session, and it will continue uh, just 45 uh, minutes. Um, now, firstly, I would like to introduce you our uh, first big distinguished speaker, our panelist, uh, Mr. Kudret Özarsay. Uh, Kudret Özarsay has various positions, uh, has held various positions in the Turkish Cypriot government. He served as the under secretary in the Turkish Cypriot government from uh, 2004 to 2008, and he was appointed as a deputy prime minister from 2008 to 2010. Additionally, he served as a chief negotiator in the negotiation team of the Turkish Cypriot side and actively participated in international negotiations for the solution of the Cyprus problem. Currently, uh, he holds a prominent role uh, politician in Turkish Cyprus politics. Also, he's an academician, uh, professor, and he lectures at He's a lecturer at uh, Eastern Mediterranean University. Uh, Mr. Zarsai, how um, can regional actors contribute uh, to the importance of energy, uh, regional cooperation, and the development of uh, long-term diplomacy in the Eastern Mediterranean? Thank you so much. Uh, I think I have 15, 20 minutes or something like that. Yes, 15 okay. minutes. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to this uh, panel. I hope it will be uh, beneficial for all the participants. I'm very pleased to uh, be here with my old friends and current friends. Uh, they are always they are going to be my friends. Um, basically, uh, the title of the panel is uh, The Way Out in the Eastern Mediterranean. But I'm afraid I will be able to talk about a partial way out uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean because the comprehensive way out is the comprehensive settlement in Cyprus, and it is related to that. And unfortunately, the existing circumstances or the state of affairs uh, is not that promising about uh, finding a comprehensive settlement uh, in this region. And for that reason, I would like to focus on the partial way out, which is, in my view, uh, which can be a kind of cooperation to exist 
between uh, the stakeholders uh, in this region. So, uh, briefly speaking, I'm planning to talk about uh, four points. Uh, so I can say something at the beginning about the structure of my presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, briefly explain some of the basic principles of regional uh, cooperation in conflict uh, areas, because in uh, areas where some of the conflicts are ongoing, and particularly the frozen conflicts are ongoing, uh, there, there exist some principles that we uh, better take into consideration in solving some of the existing problems. Secondly, uh, I would like to shed light on some good practice of regional cooperation in this region, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, and thirdly, the recent trend uh, in this region uh, which can be classified under the title of normalization, which is highly disputed uh, among the stakeholders. And finally, I'm planning to talk about, uh, make some uh, proposals for future uh, on some issues about Eastern Mediterranean. Now, regarding the uh, principles uh, relevant for the cooperation uh, in conflict areas, uh, I believe that interdependence is very critical because if we manage to achieve a kind of an interdependence uh, relationship between the conflicting parties, we will be able to eliminate the potential risk of uh, the conflict or we will be able to eliminate the conflict to turn into, into a kind of a violent conflict. So interdependence is very uh, critical and with the increasing level of interdependence, uh, we, we can minimize the risk, particularly for the foreign investment uh, in the region, uh, in those areas. And it is also helpful uh, with the creation of interdependence among the stakeholders. Uh, it will help a kind of a mutual trust uh, to develop between the conflicting parties even before uh, a durable, uh, comprehensive settlement is reached. And for the period after the comprehensive settlement, with the existence of a mutual trust, we will be able to maintain uh, the peace that is going to be reached. Therefore, in any case, the interdependence, not uh, a dependency relationship, a mutual interdependence uh, is a critical uh, principle uh, which we need to take into consideration and focus on, I believe. Uh, generally, uh, it is possible to reach uh, the case of interdependence when there is a kind of a hurting stalemate uh, in the area, uh, meaning that the existing state of affairs is damaging uh, the interests of the parties and the parties feel uh, that uh, risk and the damage and for that reason uh, the hurting stalemate uh, the existing uh, 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 problem uh, may hurt uh, the interests of the parties and encourage them to uh, take a step forward regarding a kind of a cooperation uh, for uh, creating interdependence. But even in the absence of a hurting stalemate, because it, is, uh, it can be disputed that whether we have in the Eastern Mediterranean region a kind of a hurting stalemate for all the actors, because it is definitely hurting for some actors, but it is less hurting for some other actors, uh, which may be the main source of the ongoing absence of cooperation in this uh, region. Another element uh, which can encourage a kind of an interdependence cooperation in the region is mutual benefit. Therefore, even in the absence of a hurting stalemate, uh, only, even the opportunity to have a mutual benefit for both stakeholders, it is possible to work on uh, an interdependence relationship. I know that I'm talking about something abstract, but I'm going to say something uh, concrete as well. Uh, in five minutes. 
Now, uh, the second uh, principle uh, with respect to uh, the cooperation is that the interdependence can best be achieved uh, through regional uh, cooperation, uh, that's for sure. But the third point is that we do have <coughs> cooperation in the Eastern Mediterranean now. It is true, but uh, the current mode of cooperation in the Eastern Mediterranean is uh, formulated as follows. Like Greek Cypriot, uh, Cyprus, Israel, and Greek cooperation, which is perceived against Turkey. Or Turkey and Turkish Cypriot cooperation, which is perceived against the Greek Cypriots. Or Turkey Libya uh, cooperation in the field of maritime zones, which is perceived against Greece, for example. Therefore, although we have cooperation, cooperation is not formulated in a way achieving a kind of a mutual trust uh, between all the stakeholders in the region, but it is formulated in a way balancing the increasing power of the other or uh, in a way containing the other or in a way giving the impression to the other side that it aims containing or it is against the other side. So it is important to think about the nature of cooperation uh, which is existing in the Eastern Mediterranean now uh, on different issues. Uh, and these are really uh, critical in my view. Another uh, issue of cooperation is that uh, the modality of cooperation is critical. Because in this region, uh, we do not have actors or stakeholders who have normal relationship between each other we do have a problem of recognition, non-recognition, uh, unrecognized uh, entities, non-recognized entities, or uh, in case I have a relationship with that entity, uh, this may end up with a kind of an upgrading that entity concern. Therefore, we are not talking about a normal uh, region, we are talking about a unique region Whereas, uh, the nature of relationship between the actors uh, are not that easy. Therefore, we need to work on a pragmatic ways of cooperation, pragmatic modality of cooperation, uh, which can be like a kind of a modus vivendi, a kind of a transitional deal, not even an agreement, which will not upgrade the status of the other, a kind of an alternative deal uh, will be uh, helpful. Now, in that sense, I would like to talk about uh, two concrete examples. The most recent developments uh, in the region, particularly, whereas they managed to uh, find a kind of a modus vivendi, a transitional deal, without causing recognition between the parties. As you know very well, the relationship between Lebanon and Israel is uh, still considered as a kind of a, a war, technically a war continue, uh, continues between the two. And there is no diplomatic relationship between Israel and uh, Lebanon. By the way, I'm not saying that these are uh, uh, same with the situation in Cyprus. I'm just referring to the extraordinary uh, unique characteristics of the uh, relationship. Now, uh, although there is no uh, recognition relationship between the two, for different reasons which we can discuss, last year in 2022, a kind of a deal was reached between uh, Lebanon and Israel regarding the uh, maritime delimitation and the main actors of that deal uh, were not states. Basically, uh, the energy companies, Total and ENI, uh, they were uh, helping the two to reach a deal and the deal at the end of the day was not an agreement 
signed between the two states, but it was a kind of an exchange of letters between Lebanon and United States and between Israel and United States. Two exchange of letters between uh, the third party, for example. So here I'm referring to a pragmatic solution, an exceptional uh, uh, approach regarding the nature of the deal that is going to be rich for cooperation, because they are going to cooperate and share uh, the resource in the region uh, through that mod modality. Now, after the uh, settlement of that specific dispute, Lebanon became eligible to uh, drill uh, and go forward about its natural resources. And following that deal, the Israeli prime uh, minister, the authorities, uh, argued that Lebanon has implicitly recognized Israel, which was denied by uh, uh, Lebanese authorities by saying that nothing has changed. Therefore, the, still they don't have diplomatic relationship, still they don't recognize each other, still technically there is a war between the two, but a deal was reached for cooperation in the region, uh, and I believe that this is an example which shows us that not only the states, but also the other actors of international politics, now the energy companies, can play a role and alternative ways of uh, reaching a deal is a possibility there. The second example, good practice, which I would like to mention, is the one which existed here in the case of Cyprus. In 2011, uh, my friend uh, Andreas knows very well, and I, I believe that he can uh, clarify more on that issue. There was a Murray explosion in the Greek Cypriot side. And following the explosion in the Greek Cypriot side, the power uh, plant destroyed, and there was a serious demand and a need uh, in the Greek Cypriot side uh, to electricity. Now, following 2011, immediately after that, for a while, we started to talk about providing electricity to the Greek Cypriot side, but at the beginning, uh, they were hesitant. And it was understandable, because it was argued that if the Greek Cypriot side buys electricity from the Turkish Cypriot Electricity Board, which is a public body, it may end up with a kind of recognition or upgrading the status of North Cyprus. Therefore, we worked on a pragmatic way out in that dispute, and we came to the conclusion that instead of selling the electricity via the Turkish Cypriot Electricity Board to the Greek Cypriot side, we sold the electricity via the Turkish Cypriot Chamber of Commerce to uh, the Greek Cypriot side. And even the money was transferred like that. So that was a pragmatic solution with the contribution of all the stakeholders in that dispute. And it ended up with an ad hoc electricity cooperation between the two sides, maybe uh, uh, as a result of a crisis. But later on, with the political willingness of Mr. Akinji as well, it ended up with a structural cooperation because at the end of the day, interconnector interconnecting uh, between the two electricity uh, system was created. And currently, we do have that system. So if we look at these two examples, we can say that uh, there are alternative ways of uh, achieving cooperation in the region uh, as long as we, we are uh, uh, approaching these problems uh, through a pragmatic uh, perspective. Now, uh, if I have five more minutes uh, or more, uh, more, or less. more? Less. Okay, right. Less. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Um, the recent trends uh, in the region, uh, I strongly suggest everyone to have a look at uh, the deal recently reached uh, between the Gulf, some of the Gulf countries, United Arab Emirates and Israel. Uh, which is called Abraham Accords. It is true that this is not uh, the one 
uh, this is not similar to the one reached between uh, Lebanon and Israel. Uh, it is a kind of a peace deal, a peace accord, including the diplomatic relations, a kind of a settlement of certain disputes, but not solving all the disputes. Because despite uh, the Abraham Accords reached recently uh, between the relevant actors, <coughs> and despite they managed to start direct flights and economic uh, relationship between these act uh, actors, uh, it's important to see that the territorial and sovereignty disputes between these countries still ongoing. Uh, they achieved uh, that peace deal, but certain problems are still uh, ongoing. But one specific uh, example within this picture is the deal reached recently between Jordan and Israel. Because uh, with the contribution of United Arab Emirates, because they are going to invest, uh, the uh, solar panels uh, will be established in Jordan. Electricity will be provided uh, to Israel. Israel will desalinate uh, the water and will give water back to Jordan. So this type of an <coughs> interdependence, a relationship and cooperation was formulated, of course, following the normalization of the relationship between the two uh, after 1994. The first normalization and first diplomatic relationship, 1979 between Egypt and Israel. Second one, 1994 between Jordan and uh, Israel. And third one is recent uh, Abraham uh, deal between some of the uh, Gulf countries and Israel. But uh, these type of models in the field of uh, water, desalination, electricity, and uh, other natural uh, resources can be taken, taken as a good example. And finally, I'm closing, <laughs> if I may. No, you're okay, don't worry. Andres is going to share with me some of his minutes. Of course, oh. of course. All my time. All your time. <laughs> right. Now, yes. I believe that the ongoing project, uh, which has recently been started between Israel and uh, Greek Cypriot Cyprus or South Cyprus, is very critical. And this can give a kind of a common vision uh, if we think about it together with uh, the developments between Turkey and uh, North Cyprus, TRNC. Uh, although I have some hesitation regarding the nature of relationship in the field of electricity between Turkey and North Cyprus, I think there is a potential there. Because uh, with the Euro-Asian interconnector between Israel and uh, South Cyprus, the uh, EU has recently approved that project as the EU project. And it is going to be financed by the European Union, whereas electricity uh, underwater cable is going to be established or built between Israel and Cyprus. By the way, next to my old village, Kofinu, it is going to reach there, uh, and from there to Greece. And this is going to be a novel project and a, a really big financial contribution is going to be made by the European uh, Union, and it will be completed in 2025, and the main logic of the European Union, at least, which, is, which was explained, was that we will uh, put an end, the economic energy isolation of our member state, Cyprus. This is the vision of the European Union, and this is going to be done with the solar panels and with the uh, electricity genera generation uh, through the natural gas of uh, the island of Cyprus and Israel. This is going to be done via that way, but it will be both ways. And uh, recently, there are references that Turkey is also willing to build, uh, and the project or a preliminary uh, project is going to be announced recently, uh, in the upcoming days, uh, we don't know the substance yet, uh, there is only one reference 
which was made by Mr. Erdogan in his recent visit uh, to our country, he said it will work both ways. Only that uh, concept was used. We don't know whether it is going to be that way or a different way. But if we manage to uh, get together, think about uh, the issue of electricity cooperation and interconnecting uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, instead of bringing uh, the cable which is going to be as, uh, uh, completed in 2025, or maybe later, it will be activated in 2026, uh, maybe from Cyprus, uh, another connection may be established between Cyprus and Turkey, whereas Turkey is part of the European interconnecting system, and a kind of cooperation idea can be developed. Just an example, there are too many other areas, of course, but in this picture, we need to convince the European Union as well <coughs> for our public electricity company to be transformed into a modern company as well, because we cannot continue to produce electricity via the fossil uh, uh, way uh, with the existing circumstances. But the European Union should also understand that uh, although they contribute to the South, for them to transform into the green energy, ecosystem is one here. They cannot achieve the green energy in the South while we are producing this type of electricity in the North. Therefore, with the help of the European Union, if we manage to transform our system in the North uh, into a modern system, and if this type of an electricity cooperation is uh, achieved, or if we can work on it, I believe that through the pragmatic ways or modalities of cooperation, something can be achieved. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your valuable contribution and your points, Mr. Kudretu uh, Uh Now, we, let me introduce you our next, next distinguished panelist, uh, Mr. Özil Nami uh, is a Turkish Cypriot politician and also he served as the former Minister of Economy and Energy as well as he served Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. And uh, in, 20, uh, in uh, 2015, uh, Mr. Özil was appointed as the chief negotiator for the uh, Cyprus negotiations according uh, and also uh, what is your opinion? What do you think, uh, Mr. Özdil Nami? Uh, Turkish, um, what kind of lessons Turkish side should learn from the past Cyprus negotiations? Uh, and how should the next negotiation uh, process should managed? Thank you very much. Um, let me first uh, start by uh, thanking Europolitics for organizing this event and Merit Group for uh, hosting us. Um, I'm extremely delighted to be here and also extremely delighted to uh, have uh, uh, my dear friend Andros Marianis uh, uh, join us. I think uh, that also adds to the significance of the event. We need more events like this. The title of today's uh, discussion is Track to Diplomacy, and this is exactly what it, uh, it is about, uh, because Track 1 is now uh, non-existent. The two sides are not um, um, talking, they are not negotiating, they are not generating any solutions to the variety of the problems that we have. Therefore, uh, track two diplomacy is the only avenue um, to address our um, um, common issues. We lived through a, a similar period uh, before. This is not the first time. We passed through a similar stage. Um, in those years, and this was um, in the period leading up to 2004 referendum, um, in those uh, days, there were a very intensive track to um, dialogue. Americans were heavily engaged. Even the famous Harvard um, University was sending experts, inviting uh, personalities to Boston, getting them together. Brussels was engaged. There was a group called Brussels Business Group. People were, uh, business com uh, community, were uh, asked to go to Brussels and have joint meetings. 
and um, uh, NGOs, local NGOs were heavily engaged, especially chambers of commerce of both sides and business associations. They were coming together. Um, and uh, this was um, uh, creating a lot of energy and a pressure on politicians to um, uh, find ways of re-establishing meaningful uh, dialogue. This was happening not only in Cyprus, but also in those days between us and Turkey. And Turkey was also going through a, a, a period of change. And uh, the official track was unable to catch up. And this we uh, see quite often, that uh, during um, periods of change, um, uh, uh, the anticipation of change blocks the official uh, officials, and the real initiative comes from the people. People start getting engaged and asking for this change. Um, so we are now witnessing a similar um, situation. And like my dear friend Kudret has uh, mentioned, this recognition issue is um, um, uh, blocking uh, uh, many avenues of cooperation. Recognition by implication has turned into a phobia uh, for Cypriots, for both sides, maybe a little bit more to the Greek Cypriot side, I would say, than us, as we are not recognized, but we are in fear of lo losing uh, whatever recognition we have accommodated for uh, ourselves. And there is a famous joke that goes, um, Socrates um, um, created philosophy by asking a very fundamental question, you know, saying you have to recognize yourself. You know? And uh, philo philosophy ended in Cyprus when Cypriots asked, do you recognize who I am? You see, so we have twisted around and made this recognition issue, uh, turning it uh, upside, <coughs> upside down. Now, um, <clears throat> therefore, Track 2 will carry a lot of uh, responsibility in generating new ideas on how do we move forward. We have achieved a lot. Um, we, uh, all those sitting uh, at this panel, including Mr. Uh, Am Ambassador Daryal Batubai and Kudret and Mr. Mavroyanis and myself, we did a lot of work uh, and the amalgamation of that work brought us to a conference, Cyprus conference. We went to Switzerland, to Crown Montana, so we negotiated that uh, almost everything regarding the content of the solution. We divided the Cyprus issue into its various um, uh, headings, governance and power sharing, economy, property, territory, relations with the European Union. We established various committees that would assist us. Um, one example of uh, a concrete cooperation, similar to what Kudret said, was um, uh, our uh, joint committee on um, um, uh, uh, aligning future Turkish Cypriot constituent states to um, the European Union, Aki. We established an EU ad hoc committee, and without two sides recognizing each other, we created a modality that allowed our bureaucrats to work together and to visit Brussels together without leading to recognition, which shows us when there is a will, there is a way we can create. And all the amalgamation of that work took us to Crown Montana to finalize uh, the Cyprus issue and achieve the comprehensive settlement. Because everything we could do regarding the um, content of the solution, regarding confidence building, whatever was in our uh, ability, we did it. And we took the process to its uh, logical conclusion, right next to it. But we failed. We failed to uh, pass the finishing line. So, in my mind, the real question that we need to focus right now is why? Why did we fail? Why couldn't we cross the finishing line? And, uh, and the answer to that question should also be a guiding light to the work of the Track 2 diplomacy. Because Track 2 diplomacy becomes very useful when it has a very well-established, uh, well-defined goal to achieve. It must serve a specific purpose. So from the experiences that I have had uh, in my almost 25 years of negotiation, the conclusion I came was 
the part that we missed, whether it was to have effective confidence building measures, effective cooperation on energy, or um, to reach comprehensive settlement, was we never really spent a lot of time um, designing a proper negotiating process. We thought diving into the content of the negotiations, trying to solve the property issue, trying to solve the um, um, power sharing issue in itself would result um, in, a, in a solution. And uh, let me give you a quote by a very famous um, uh, Harvard uh, professor, Deepak really? Motra, um, who, uh, who is uh, one of the, the world experts on negotiation process. And he says, and I quote, what had led to this conflict in everything from mundane negotiations to complex deal making to protracted, to protracted conflicts, I have often witnessed a tendency to rush towards achieving agreement on substance and to ignore alignment on process. Of course, both are necessary, but when it comes to important negotiations, process considerations should, in large part, precede, pre and this is very important, precede substantive deal-making. Negotiate process before substance. This is what this Harvard professor uh, recommends. In Cyprus, we did exactly the opposite. We tried to negotiate the substance before we negotiated the process. The process was always kept open-ended. No uh, result-oriented mechanism was uh, included. No arbitration was included. The only ex uh, exception to this was when uh, we uh, went for the Annam plan. And the arbitration for the Annam plan was actually never endorsed officially by either side. And we uh, took uh, the final plan to referendum without the two leaders signing it. And we ended up in failure. Therefore, therefore, in my view, looking ahead, looking ahead, uh, <coughs> we have to find a way to design a new process first. The content is almost done. We have all the convergence uh, uh, papers, agreements. The content is done. The, the missing link is the process. When do we start? But also, when do we finish? How much time are we going to allow ourselves to negotiate? What will, hap what will happen when we end that time period. What kind of an arbitration or deadlock resolving mechanism are we going to engage in order to have the final comprehensive settlement agreement? And when we go and ask people whether they approve this agreement, the result of our negotiations, what will happen if both sides say yes, if both sides say no, if one side say yes and one side say no, these must be a priori defined. If this is well defined, then we will know that we are going to have an, a concrete outcome at the end of the process. Whether that outcome is a federation or a two-state will be determined by <laughs> our negotiations on the process. But an outcome will come. So, in my view, coming back to uh, the topic, and I guess I am now in my last yeah. uh, few minutes. In my view, track to diplomacy will pay, play a vital role <coughs> in creating this. Because the Turkish side has locked itself in a very rigid position. We are saying, together with Turkey, that the period of negotiating for a federal solution is over. We have exhausted that. From now on, we can only talk about a two-state solution. Whereas the Greek Cypriot side is saying that, <laughs> no, we are uh, a recognized country. There is a well-defined UN basis on how we are going to solve our problem. And we are not going to uh, accept a two-state solution. And we will go back 
to resume negotiations, but they, uh, without committing themselves when to finish it, and what happens if once again the Greek Cypriot voters should vote against a solution, or a Greek Cypriot leader should decide to leave the negotiation table, both experiences that we have had in the past. Therefore, um, they will not, neither leadership will step down from these uh, positions voluntarily, okay? Um, unless an angel comes from the heavens and touches them and gives them infinite uh, wisdom, they will not do it. Their political realities will not allow them to walk down by themselves. We have to help them. We have to help them. We, meaning all the people who are now working unofficially, be, um, away from the official, have to help the leadership to find a face-saving formula to go back to the rational basis of a negotiation. This would mean for the Turkish side going back to the well-established UN um, um, uh, table, but for the Greek Cypriot side to accept that we cannot repeat the experience of the 50, past 50 years. We cannot ask uh, ourselves to um, re-engage in an open-ended uh, uh, manner without uh, a, a guaranteed solution. And we have to bring the two sides to a, a, a new uh, process based on the well-established UN parameters, but in a time-limited, result-oriented manner. And track to diplomacy can be extremely fruitful to make this happen behind closed doors, with private meetings, by brainstorming, getting academicians, politicians, individuals together. And this will benefit not only us, but through, uh, like Mr. Özersay has said, um, its implications on energy cooperation, on security cooperation, building interdependencies. And if this thinking takes root, and if we see the light at the end of the tunnel, even without reaching the comprehensive settlement, prior to that, these kind of projects will gain pace. But in the absence of any perspective for a comprehensive settlement, I am a bit um, uh, more pessimistic or skeptical that um, uh, the types of cooperation that we would like to see on energy, on security on immigration, illegal immigration, uh, will fail to materialize. But when there is a perspective for a solution, a realistic expectation, then, like the examples given regarding electricity interconnectivity between North and South, like um, the EU ad hoc committee, like the cultural committee, like the health committee, things can move in the right direction with the anticipation that we are going to have a comprehensive settlement and in support of that. So it's a very critical time, and I think this uh, seminar was a very timely one. I hope it uh, inspires more of such uh, meetings in the future from different uh, parties, and uh, we, we achieve uh, a, a good result. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much uh, for your valuable contribution, Mr. Özdil Nami. Now, uh, I would like to introduce our next distinguished panelist, Mr. Andreas Mavriyanis. Uh, he's a separate diplomat and also a politician. And uh, he also served as the United Nations ambassador in uh, addition to several other diplomatic positions. He's also uh, the former Cyprus representative of European, European Union. And also um, from 2015 to 2017, uh, he served as the negotiator of the Greek community in the <laughs> Cyprus negotiations. Uh, and also, uh, he participated as an independent uh, presidential candidate in the 2023 Cyprus presidential elections. Now, uh, Mr. Andras, uh, what's your opinion and what do you think uh, 
about the lessons that should be learned from the Cyprus negotiations and how should the negotiation process uh, be structured based on the experience of the past negotiations. Mm -hmm. The floor is yours. Thank you, Nisa. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, I thank uh, uh, Europolitical uh, for organizing this uh, seminar. I th thank you all for participating. I'm uh, really very happy and moved to be on the same uh, panel as uh, my close uh, friends, uh, Ostil Nami and Gudred Orzersai, with whom we had uh, the chance to negotiate for the settlement of the Cyprus problem. I'm very happy to meet Ambassador Dari al Bey. Uh, I know that uh, he has a long experience on this kind of issues, and uh, we are very honored and happy to have you. Uh, of course, I see in the room some of uh, uh, my very good old friends like uh, Fikri and uh, others. So uh, this uh, makes the whole environment very friendly <coughs> and familiar for me. And uh, uh, I believe, uh, Nisa, that uh, yes, uh, uh, there has been a very long negotiating process for the Cyprus problem. And uh, it's not about, uh, for me, if you like, questioning the intentions of the ones or the others. There were always uh, some <coughs> flaws in the process, and we tried a lot of, a lot of things, if you like. And, uh, you know, comparing various initiatives that uh, uh, took place in the past, we had situations where the United Nations were having the upper hand and they were trying to shape and determine, if you like, the elements of the settlement. And uh, this approach gave rise first to the Boutros Ghali set of ideas and a, a later effort gave uh, the uh, Anand plan, both of them had, you know, some uh, good elements that they were presenting a comprehensive approach to the Cyprus problem, but uh, uh, there was certainly some, uh, you know, questioning by many people about the fact that it was felt that it was coming from the outside. So. The difference of the last effort that uh, led us to Gran Montana in 2017 is that based on the uh, statement uh, the, of the leaders of the 11th February 2014, we managed to uh, embark on a process which was free negotiation, of course, within the framework of the United Nations, and of course, you know, based on, on the parameters defined by the Security Council, but everything was on the table. And for the first time ever, first time ever, we were able to negotiate, at the end of the process, issues like territory, and property, and then we went, as Hostil was saying, we went to Geneva in January 2017, and we discussed security, first time ever. These dimensions were always around, and they were part of the Anand plan, for instance. There, was, there were provisions on security, never negotiated, never, never. I was part of the negotiation so many years. So, <laughs> so for the first time ever, we were able to have everything on the table. With all this, if you like, idea of table one and table two, table one consisting of the communities and the guarantors and the UN, table two having the internal aspects, etc. But there was a package there was a package, and there was a package where all the elements were interdependent. <coughs> so
So the price we paid, of course, is that when you fail, the whole package fails. And since then, <coughs> since 2017, we are trying to put the process back on track. We managed to have uh, the meeting in Berlin in November 2019, <coughs> which was a very important building block in going back to the negotiations. Then we had, of course, you know, COVID, postponement of the elections here in the north. Then we had the election of uh, Mr. Tadar and a new situation where we uh, have, if you like, an effort to do away with <coughs> the product of the negotiations so far by uh, having an insistence on uh, two states sovereign equality, which are completely out of the parameters of the United Nations, of course. But this is not the main problem for me, because any politician, any government, any party has the right to have their positions. They cannot forget the framework of the UN, but of course they can say, my aim is two states, my aim is sovereign equality. The problem starts when you try to put this as a precondition <coughs> in order to start negotiation. How can you ask me to accept your position in order to go to the negotiating table. What is this? Is this negotiation? However, we managed in 2021 to have the meetings in Geneva where eventually, if you like, there was a slight movement from this position. You know, Mr. Tadar, who was saying uh, uh, immediately after his election, I will only go to negotiations if my sovereign equality, if this and that. He said, I will go there only to discuss this. Fair enough, fair enough. If you don't ask me to accept your position, we can meet. So this is the most fundamental <coughs> thing for me. The most fundamental thing is not to have preconditions to go without prejudice to, to the respective, if you like, uh, positions and uh, 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 political, if you like, uh, uh, how to say, uh, the approach we have about uh, our political rights and our legality, etc. This is the only way you can go back. At the same time, we need to be conscious of something else, which is also the theme of our meeting today, you know, which is what do we do in the Eastern Mediterranean? What is our responsibility in the Eastern Mediterranean? And what is the overall approach <coughs> that needs to be taken? Both Hostile and Kudret, we are absolutely right to talk about the need to have an approach that at the end, at the end, will produce the desired result. And that you cannot, you cannot say that you need to have the result first in order to start cooperation, because it's, uh, you know, it, it's putting uh, the cart in front of the horses. So, and this is very fundamental. And Nisa, you mentioned, you know, uh, that I was candidate for uh, the presidency of the Republic of Cyprus in the elections last February. And this leads me to say a few words about my fundamental position on what <coughs> should be done in Cyprus and in the Eastern Mediterranean. Kutret, mentioned some examples I would uh, have liked to mention myself, but he knows much more prominent than anybody else around here. So he's a professor, so he, has, <laughs> he knows everything very, very well. But, uh, but indeed, 
he started by talking about interdependence. Interdependence is key. The only difference I have with Coutret is that Coutret sees interdependence as the product of an effort. For me, it's not necessarily in contradiction, okay? But for me, it, interdependence is an objective reality. This is what you have. What you should do is not to try to negate this interdependence and to make it subject to political considerations. You need to understand that this is there, geography is there, history is there, you know, economic relations need to go uh, through this interdependence and you need to align yourself with the natural course of things. So at the end of the day, we, what we are doing through our political problems is going against, against the natural course of things. And we are creating a virtuous circle where there is space for a virtuous one. So my own approach in the presidential elections, and most of you, you have seen that <coughs> in every statement, I was mentioning what I was calling the organic conditions of peace. It's not my expression. This is an expression by Jean Monnet, which was at the hard core of the idea of the European unification. So when in 1950, Jean Monnet along with Schumann and others, had the Schumann Declaration. The, what was the idea? The idea was that, you know, France and Germany and Europe has been through hell. Two world wars, a lot of problems. At the time, even, you know, France had the territorial claims on Germany with Saarbrück and all those things, a lot of problems. So. How can you create conditions where you are going to overcome the problems? One way is this traditional way we're talking about here in Cyprus. Let's sit at the table and negotiate. And then when we solve the problem, it will be the time for everything else to be put in place and feed into the system. The other way is to start <coughs> with practical ways of cooperation, which will change the nature of the problem. And you know the very famous uh, expression, if you cannot solve a problem, change the context. And check what is changing <coughs> the context. Changing the context means, meant at the time that you know, we were putting uh, coal and steel together, Later on, it was atomic energy. That was an effort for the European defense community. Then there was the common market. So creating what Jean Monnet was calling practical solidarities that would shape you know, a new situation in the continent. And it's this approach that today made even the idea of thinking about a war between France and Germany unthinkable. It was not a negotiation per se. It was creating organic conditions. So you can take this mudatis mudandis to other areas. And I'm very happy that Kudret made reference to this Lebanon-Israeli agreement. This is exactly what we need to do if we want to create organic conditions. We can go on forever. The Lebanese and the Israelis are in a situation of war. They don't recognize each other, exactly as Kutret described things. However, they managed to have a kind of an agreement. Is this agreement formal? For me, yes, because international law is not formal. And it was very easy to have it 
true. I prefer not to say it. Yes, okay, but this is what it is. This is what it is. At the end of the day, there was meeting of wills to do this. And therefore, you start by doing this, and then you have a building blocks, and you do more and more. The same, this exactly the same thing applies to uh, the Abraham Accords, different situation, more formal if you like, but there again, without prejudice. You don't expect to solve all your problems no. in order to find avenues of cooperation. So this is exactly what I was calling in the election campaign the teleological approach based on the Aristotelian logic that you know you need to have a vision for peace and we, I hope that all of, all of us here, we have this vision and this vision is to be together, to work, to cooperate, to build, you know, uh, to have a situation where we are going to thrive together, one way or the other, without having an agreement on every single element. But there is a vision. And then, at the service of this vision, you have this dialectical relationship between the elements and the means that are the building blocks in a way that you are going to achieve this important and lofty aim. Now it is important, however, to bear in mind that in this teleological approach, the aims and the objectives do not justify the means, okay? Define the teleological approach, the, the, the aims, define the means, and the means have to be those that are consistent with the values and with the content of the aim. So this is what we need to do here in Cyprus. And this is what we need to do in the Eastern Mediterranean more broadly. And probably you know that uh, my own idea was that the number one priority for the government should have been to bring, for instance, natural gas from the Aphrodite Reserve to Cyprus in order to change not only the energy, but the economic mix of the country, and not only for the South and the Greek Cypriots, for the whole Cyprus, to have the Turkey Cypriot community being able to have all the natural gas they need under the same conditions as in Greek Cypriots. And this, you understand, would have changed a lot of things. And at the time, and I know what I'm talking about, the European Union was ready to finance 90% of this small pipeline to bring the gas from Aphrodite to Basilicon and then to distribute it. So this is one thing. Of course, there are many others. There are many others. Let me mention that uh, we live in a world, we all know, you know, what we are going through with uh, the war between Russia and Ukraine, the problems in Syria, what is happening in the Mediterranean in, gen in general with the progressive withdrawal of the United States from the area, that you have other powers that are coming in. This um, shift of the center of the uh, Sino-American problem from Europe to Asia, etc. There are a lot of issues, a lot of factors that are changing in the world, but there are also some constants. And one of them is that, you know, the relationship between Europe and Turkey, the relationship between Turkey and the broader neighbor, uh, neighborhood. So there, what I believe based exactly on this approach is to go back to the fundamental European approach, which is with all partners more for more. You engage, you do things, 
And every time you do something, you progress. <coughs> I don't know whether Turkey will be able, willing, whatever. You know, I don't want to enter into the discussion about accession of Turkey. I don't want. I have nothing against, but I mean, this is not, you know, it happened many a time uh, without result. But what is crucial is that a good relationship between the European Union and Turkey is very helpful to us. So we could imagine and envisage a lot of things that could be done from <coughs> the modernization of the customs union of Turkey to the Ankara Protocol to the idea that uh, uh, he suggested during the campaign and everybody was about to kill me, you know, why don't we, <laughs> don't we allow companies to cooperate and uh, send natural gas to Turkey for its own needs? And a lot of things, a lot of things. So the logic at the end of the day is, you know, let's reverse the order of things. Let's, and it was exactly, I think, you would see that all three of us are on the same board on this. Don't wait the end in order to do things, because then what you are doing, and you know, I'm a lawyer, you know, uh, Kudret is a lawyer, or still has been involved in politics his whole life. You know, we don't believe that, you know, a settlement is an issue of legal provisions. It's much more than that. If we want it to be helpful, if we want to change the society and the people, and this is, by the way, the only positive message that stays with us, because, as Hostel was saying, we are not really negotiating. It's almost six years now. And, you know, we try to build track two diplomacy with enormous difficulties. We are hostages of things that are happening around. So the positive message is that, you know, if we start <coughs> building with small building blocks and in, the, in this logic of creating those organic conditions of peace, we might be able to shape a new negotiating process at the end of the day in order to cover, again, as Hostel was saying, the last remaining mile. There was just one last remaining mile. So it is possible. So please keep this dimension that we can do it. And really, you know, you, you are seeing the friendship that exists between us. Mm -hmm. It goes even beyond us. If you go to Turkey, you are going to find people okay, with Mr. whom Anderson, we have been negotiating. It's the end. So just believe, and this is uh, what I'm saying, uh, Nisa, at the end of the day, yes, we can resume negotiation if we go back to this fundamental logic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for yeah, your you comments, for Mr. Mr. Anderson. <laughs> uh, and Mr. Uh, Uzarsai, if you have, Kudret Uzarsai, if you have any remarks, some additions. But Ambassador is going oh, okay. to make the speech, yes. and maybe after that, after the break. Okay. Yes. Uh, now I would like to introduce our next distinguished panelist, Mr. Daryal Batubey. Uh, he is a former ambassador, and he held the various positions in the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And afterwards, he served uh, as the ambassador to Zagreb and Beijing, and as well as uh, the Parliament uh, representative of the Council of Europe. And additionally, he lectured in the Department of uh, International Relations at Middle East Technical University. And also, Mr. Daryal serves as the chairman of the Eastern Mediterranean Policy Think Tank. Uh, Mr. Daryal, do you think that in the current conjuncture, uh, diplomacy conditions uh, for a general solution to the Cyprus problem will be realized in the short term? 
and what conditions are necessary for a diplomatic solution in the Eastern Mediterranean. And also the second question, what is the perspective of Turkey and Greece foreign policies on the Eastern Mediterranean and the Cyprus problem? Thank you. Uh, I've heard the three speakers who spoke before me, and I agree with most of what they say. So let me focus on your uh, other uh, issue you raised, Turkish-Greek differences in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, uh, the problem, I think, that creates this Turkish-Greek differences mostly in the Eastern Mediterranean and which led almost to a confrontation between the two countries in 2018 is, the, uh, is this beautiful small island, Castellorizo, just one and a half kilometers off the Turkish coast. Uh, I've, the, the Turkish town facing Castellorizo is Kaş, and I have spent several holidays there. You would be amazed how uh, the relation between the island, uh, island inhabitants and the Kash inhabitants, uh, they, they interact practically every day. They shop, <laughs> uh, you know, most of the Costellerizo inhabitants come to Kash for shopping. Uh, they don't even need documentation anymore <laughs> to, to go back and forth between the island and Kash. So it's amazing that such a local relationship based on friendly cooperation uh, can create such <laughs> uh, conflicts in the broader uh, Eastern Mediterranean area. Now, uh, the Greeks, Greek claims full uh, maritime jurisdiction area for Castellerizo, which Turkey opposes strongly. And Turkey has signed a, uh, a maritime agreement with the Libyan government, which Greece uh, uh, opposes uh, strongly because it, uh, because it uh, violates, in the Greek perspective, the, uh, the jurisdiction, maritime jurisdiction areas of Crete and Rhodes. Now, both of these objections, in my view, are legally correct. Turkey, let me briefly say, Turkey's uh, objections to Costellerizo claiming uh, a large maritime jurisdiction area uh, is clearly against uh, 1982 uh, <coughs> Law of the Sea Convention, which says that maritime uh, jurisdiction limitation should be done by agreement based on the principle of equity and taking into consideration all local relevant circumstances. So we have these three uh, cri criteria for delimitation, maritime delimitation, by agreement, equity, and local circumstances. Now, Costellerizo is 570 nautical miles from Greece mainland, one and a half kilometers from the Turkish coast. The population of Costellerizo is 495, and those people live there, in order to live there, are uh, generously uh, subsidized by the Greek government. And mo they meet most of their daily needs from the Turkish coast, Turkish town of Kash. Uh, so by claiming such a huge maritime area of 40,000 nautical miles for this island, clearly is against the law. Uh, and we have 
uh, many uh, case law based on many uh, judgments of international courts for similar cases where an island belonging to one country is located very closely to the coast of another country. We have, well, let me give you a few examples. The Channel Islands, British Islands, close to the French coast. Uh, French Islands, close to the Canadian coast. Uh, Ukrainian Island, which has been in the news recently because of the war in Ukraine. Serpent Island, close to the Romanian coast, and so forth. They all, all these judgments, have established a case law basically stating that such islands, that is, belonging to one country, but located close to the coast of another country, can only have limited maritime jurisdiction, usually restricted to its territorial waters. So, now coming to the Turkish case of the Libyan agreement, uh, this, uh, the claim that Turkey has made by this agreement, uh, the claim of uh, maritime jurisdiction runs very close to, say, Crete. Crete is a very large island, uh, having a population of more than 600,000 people. Uh, so it is fully entitled to a full uh, maritime jurisdiction area, like the mainland. And it is, in, in addition, 300 nautical miles away from the Turkish coast. So the Turkish deal with Libya is not possible to sustain in accordance to the international law, maritime law. So there is, uh, there is a possibility that diplomacy can work to resolve this specific Greek Cypriot, Greek, uh, Greek Turkish dispute in the Eastern Mediterranean, provided both sides will be uh, will, will be prepared to, uh, to have a give and take uh, attitude. What this needs, I think, is a third party which can help the two countries, Greece and Turkey, to arrive at such an amicable solution, diplomatic solution. In the past, the United States usually provided such help, assistance, to two NATO allies. Uh, but under the Biden administration, this doesn't look very hopeful, uh, given Biden administration's or United States relations, present day relations with Turkey and Greece. There was a, an opening, which I was very uh, pleased to, to, to notice, that before she retired from politics, German Chancellor Merkel Tried, to, her, tried her hand in uh, mediating between Turkey and Greece. Uh, it's unfortunate that, uh, and, uh, because <coughs> Germany, of all the members of the European Union, have the closest and strongest links with ties with Turkey, so is in a, uh, in a you know, favorable position to, to, to be helpful. But it didn't work, unfortunately. And uh, I don't know whether the present German government would be interested uh, in providing, uh, in, uh, in assuming such an initiative. But in principle, I believe that the, uh, there is a diplomatic possibility to resolve the Greek-Turkish differences in Eastern Mediterranean. And now, uh, first, the election process in the two countries, and then the earthquake in Turkey, which and the Greek uh, support uh, for the victims and the destruction and so forth. 
there is a new atmosphere, and once the election will be finally over in, uh, in, in, in Greece, that we have had until now a de facto moratorium. That is to say, both countries have refrained from unilateral actions. Uh, that is a helpful way uh, of seeking a diplomatic solution. That is how the Turkey and Greece managed to, uh, uh, to, to control the Aegean dispute between themselves by basically uh, refraining most of the time from unilateral actions. Uh, they, uh, they signed a, an agreement, an accord in Bern in 1976, which basically formally committed the two countries to such a moratorium, that is to say, refraining from unilateral actions. And uh, it was violated twice in 1986 and 96, but then again with American intervention, uh, the moratorium was restored. And until now, uh, despite the Aegean dispute, and disputes even, Turkish-Greek relations over time have not only been peaceful, the, the, the disputes under control, but the relations have developed, tourism, economic relations, etc. So I see no reason why the moratorium can be maintained in the Mediterranean now that uh, it's clear that the energy issue is no longer a defining uh, factor in the, because the East Med project is not feasible anymore. Uh, all the parties recognize that. So uh, I think the Greek-Turkish relationship in the Eastern Mediterranean, I, I hope and believe that the, the, the moratorium will, will, will be maintained uh, and hopefully there will be uh, an effort to resolve the, 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 the Eastern Mediterranean differences based on international law at, one, at some point in the future. Now, on Cyprus, I agree with uh, most of the speakers. Uh, the, the leadership on both sides uh, is not conducive to an overall settlement, regrettably. Uh, and the magic words for, uh, for, uh, for a better at atmosphere is using interdependence, promoting interdependence, uh, projects, uh, cooperative projects with concrete results for both sides. I think that is the crucial words. Uh, when there was no negotiating process in the past, past 50 years, uh, the idea of confidence building measures always surfaced in, in Cyprus. And the most favorable CBM or confidence building measure was the Varosha uh, and Erjan airport deal. Uh, in the past, the Greek Cypriot side has rejected that CBM, I think seven times or so. Uh, recently, it was the proposal, the same proposal came from the Greek Cypriot side, but was rejected this time by the Turkish Cypriot side. I think that, is, uh, that would have been a very substantive uh, CBM. But looking at others, I agree that we need concrete, uh, beneficial, concretely beneficial uh, projects. Uh, uh, you know, there are things which I believe the, the, the Cypriot president also could take uh, without unilaterally, without really uh, jeopardizing uh, the overall uh, situation. For example, instead of going around in European capitals for a EU 
uh, role, expanded EU role in, in the Cyprus conflict, which will lead nowhere, uh, which will never be accepted by the Turkish side for obvious reasons, and so forth. If I were advising him, I would have suggested two things, unilateral gestures, gestures which would change, somewhat help change the, 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 the political atmosphere between the two sides in Cyprus. One is uh, initiating Turkish as an official language of the European Union, which uh, is, after all, an official language of the Republic of Cyprus. So doing really nothing uh, spectacular, but would be a, a gesture of some sort, which would be noticed. And secondly, there is a humanitarian issue of children of mixed marriages of Turkish Cypriots and Turkish nationals of Turkey, you know, and recognizing uh, their rights to the citizenship of the Republic uh, would be, again, a gesture which would be well received, I think, in the North, without, basic, without even, you know, changing any of the official positions concerning the Cyprus issue, Cyprus problem, <coughs> etc. But on a more substantively, I think the two sides can now work to, to open new crossing points between them because there is a growing traffic in both directions in Cyprus and there are long waits and people should be, you know, uh, to, uh, should, be, should have the opportunity to interact more easily with each other. Uh, there was, uh, there is a nice uh, energy cooperation project financed by the European Union in the green area zone uh, of solar project of 50 megawatts. Uh, you know, a small project, but I think this, this is a good beginning for a, you know, bicommunal uh, energy project, and it, sh it can be uh, expanded, enlarged, because there is a long <laughs> no man's land, uh, you know, running from the east to the west. Uh, uh, there are, you know, many concrete things which can come to mind. Our, my, our friend in the Turkish Greek Forum, uh, Achilleas Demetriadis had made, a, I think, a very interesting suggestion to turn the old Nicosia airport in the no man's land into a hospital with, that can be used for uh, pandemics of various sorts for both communities. I was, I'm really surprised that there was no reaction from either side in Cyprus to such an interesting and positive idea. So these are things which, are, which would yield concrete results, concrete benefits for both sides. So I think, I believe that this is the time to work on such projects in Cyprus, hoping that there will be a more suitable political atmosphere for an overall settlement, which I'm afraid I don't see it in the near future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Daryal Batibay, about the perspective uh, of Turkey and Greece uh, uh, foreign policies on the Eastern Mediterranean topic. And also, uh, thank you for all our distinguished panelists uh, uh, for their valuable <coughs> speech. Uh, now, just we have uh, 10 minutes coffee break time. After coffee break time, we will continue question and answer session. Uh, as Özil just mentioned, as the second track diplomacy, we are trying to put pressure on those decision uh, makers or a kind of a convincing activity uh, through the uh, public diplomacy. We are trying to do that. 
Uh, otherwise, of course, I do agree with you uh, and uh, that it has to be something natural. And uh, I also share the view that in the case of European Union, as you uh, correctly uh, explained and reminded us, uh, the coal and steel cooperation created that interdependence, but there as well, we had Jean Monnet, uh, some uh, potential leaders uh, trying to put pressure and uh, you know, s support the idea. So at the end of the day, uh, I believe that a kind of an evolutionary approach, which was the case within the European Union, uh, can be uh, really beneficial. Uh, and uh, step by step, uh, it can end up with a kind of an integration, which is called by some uh, scholars now as a kind of a federal uh, state now uh, within the European Union. Um, another point uh, that I want to mention uh, is the precondition which has been put by the Turkish Cypriot side. Now, I do understand uh, uh, the concern, of course. There is a fair point there that we negotiate and when we leave the negotiation room or when the process collapses, uh, we as the Turkish Cypriot side end up with no status in international law, and there is such a concern, it has always been uh, emphasized by all of us in the past. But I'm not quite sure whether this, is, this can be the solution, like making it as a precondition for the uh, commencement of the negotiations. There is a, a question mark there. I made a speech uh, in the parliament uh, some years ago when this issue was first raised, and I said, Today, if Mr. Christodelidis, if he invites Mr. Tatar to negotiate on two-state solution, Mr. Tatar cannot negotiate. He cannot attend that meeting even, because he has a precondition. He said that only after the recognition of or acceptance of the sovereign equality, I can go to negotiate. So I want two-state solution, they say, but they are not eligible according to their position to negotiate the two-state solution even. There is such a paradox uh, there. Uh, but I must say that this is not a surprising position because now I am teaching uh, at the uh, master's uh, level the negotiation uh, topics, and there have been many such precondition uh, examples <coughs> in other uh, conflicts as well. Uh, the message I got, Andreas, from this statement and the uh, repetition of the same sentence by Mr. Erdogan in his, in his recent visit is that we are not ready to negotiate now. A kind of, uh, it's not time message is given. I believe that they know that this is not going to happen. Therefore, this is a message uh, that it's not time. This is how I read it. But interestingly, um, uh, something not similar, but same, but similar, uh, also comes from uh, the South. Now I got, uh, I was reading uh, the recent uh, news. Mr. Christo de Lidis, he made a statement and called the Turkish Cypriot side uh, to start the negotiations where left off in Kranz Montana. I mean, uh, as if nothing happened, as if all these things explained by Özdil, uh, that unless we redesign the uh, process and we just do what we have done so far, we will end up with the same, uh, maybe the collapse. Therefore, it is necessary to revisit the existing positions, and this is valid for both sides, I believe. With this vision, or with the absence of a vision, I don't think that we can uh, reach to any uh, point. And finally, uh, Ambassador Batuay uh, explained uh, from a different perspective, and he made a reference to involvement of a third party, which I agree. And I want to uh, briefly mention the involvement of the third party, uh, the United States, in the case of Israel-Lebanon, in the case of the Abraham uh, Accords, in the case of Camp David, in the case of some other uh, deals between Israel and Morocco, 
in the case of uh, the deal between Israel and some other countries in the Middle East. U.S. involvement as a third party uh, was there. But we have to be realistic. What is the situation in the Eastern Mediterranean now? United States, uh, it seems that uh, is willing to diminish the involvement and the penetration of the Russians in the Eastern Mediterranean. If this is the case, we need to ask the question, will this be achieved through a kind of a cooperation between the Turkish Cypriots, Greek Cypriots, and the other actors in the region, or not? Uh, what is uh, the existing position of the United States, and what will be the case in two years' time regarding the involvement of Russia? Because it seems that with the normalization of the situation in Syria, the Syrian government has recently been accepted again as the member of the Arab League. So uh, it seems that the next step for Syria will be the limitation of its maritime boundaries together with Turkey. And in that area, most probably, we will see new companies be involved. But I do expect Russian companies in that case, most probably Gazprom or others, uh, to be there as well. So what will be uh, the Turkish foreign policy regarding Russia uh, uh, in the framework of U.S.-Turkey relations uh, uh, will be very uh, important in understanding uh, the involvement of the U.S. as a third party for these type of uh, cooperation uh, possibilities. And I think we need to think about these elements together <coughs> uh, and work on them as second track diplomacy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. and Mr. Kudrat Bey. And now, uh, if our uh, panelists have any remarks, you can tell. If I may, I just make two, two points, very brief. Um, when I was a student, um, we were learning um, uh, economic history. And uh, they were teaching us about the Great Depression in 1930s and um, the, the split between the classical economists and the Keynesian economists, Keynesian thought. Uh, Keynes was going against the classical uh, uh, thinking. The classical thinking was, listen, um, economy has its own uh, dynamics. Just give it time and people will start once again re-establishing the proper wages, uh, they will start working together, and equilibrium will be once again established, um, but it just takes time in the long run. And the Keynes said, uh, all this is true, Adam Smith, invisible hand, classical, but in the long run, we will all be dead. So we have to do something today to fix our economic uh, problems. And um, so this is... <laughs> Uh, a little bit uh, my reaction to uh, this uh, concept of evolutionary uh, approach. You know, we are unable to solve the comprehensive settle uh, find a comprehensive settlement. Therefore, let's use the time to build bridges and cooperation between the two sides. Um, I am a full uh, supporter of cooperation and confidence building measures. I actively participate in, but. This can never replace our ambition to um, bring about a comprehensive settlement. These are like twin sisters. They have to hold each other's hand, and they must walk uh, together, together. And when they walk together, then they become successful, both, both lines. And um, uh, in, in, uh, I refer to education. Another uh, class we talked was mathematics, and those who like uh, those of you who like mathematics, there was a subject called calculus and analytic geometry, and there were equations with lots of variables. It's like the Cyprus uh, problem with lots of variables, and you are trying to solve that equation. And one of the tricks used was to take the variables to limit, to the limit, um, take the numbers to infinity, for example, and you check what happens to the result of the equation. So. <laughs> Whenever we um, write a prescription to solve the Cyprus problem, we have also to think in those analytical terms. 
what, what if we do this and we do it very successfully and we take it to the limit? What do we see in that limit? What I see in that limit is what we did, what the, the place we reached in Crown Montana. Let's assume that we um, design a very nice uh, uh, process. We build very good friendships and we support those with lots of nice confidence building measures. Okay, and we reach to the very, very end, to the very limit. What happens in that point? That is the question in my mind. And I think that is the uh, question that we have to find an answer to. And that's why I refer to this uh, uh, process thing. Because in my experience, even if we do everything right, when we come to the limit, if we don't design that mechanism that will push us uh, uh, beyond that limit, we will again fall back. To, and, and when we fall back, we fall very hard. Because the higher we raise the expectations, the more hurtful is uh, the fall. And this uh, exactly happened. Thank so you. That was my comment. Thank you for your remarks, Mr. Ozdinami. And uh, Mr. Andreas, if you have any remarks. I, you know, as a matter of fact, I have many, but uh, we're going to stay here for days <laughs> to discuss all those things. It was a, it was a very rich discussion. I myself, unfortunately, I have to leave in 15 minutes, so I would uh, rather say just very briefly two things. First, to agree with Ostil that, uh, uh, you know, what you do uh, on track two and what you do in real life is not an alternative. The, those things have to work together, and you need to have always in mind that you need a comprehensive settlement, and you need to work for, for it, and all those elements should be at the service of this. So it's not just about a normalization of a status quo, which is not satisfactory by definition. So we need to bear this in mind, and I agree with you still. The other thing is uh, drawing from what uh, uh, Ambassador Dariel was saying, you know, I believe personally, in third-party intervention, not only in the way described by, by Kutret, but also in the sense that we need to, all of us to understand that what we have in international law is the main mitigating factor against you know, the prevalence of might and the United Nations and collective security is the only game in town that which allows us to move forward. So for me, third party intervention has to encompass collective security and the United Nations, and it encompasses also that we agree on what, is, what are the rules of international law, and we appeal to jurisdictions that can sort out the limitation cases and all other issues. This is the way you solve in a constructive and friendly way all those issues between states. So uh, it is most unfortunately that we have not managed yet to make use of uh, the jurisdictional means that are afforded to us because we can go on forever having Turkey saying that, you know, uh, islands have no rights and Greece saying uh, islands have all rights. Of course, uh, islands in accordance with the Convention on the Law of the Sea have rights, but also uh, big land countries have also rights. Somebody has to find out what is, uh, you know, the result that needs to be achieved by using all those things. But sorry, I don't want to continue because I would like to leave some time for some, some questions and answers and because all this discussion is very rich to be continued. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for your remarks, uh, Mr. Andreas. Now, uh, we have just 10 minutes uh, for the question and answer session. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask. First, you can introduce yourself. After that, you can ask your question. My name is Haji Roussos. 
I am a member of the Maronite community, and I'm not going to ask a question. I just want to make a comment. Uh, I hear every time all these type of conferences, the analysis of the failures and the reasons for failing on some negotiations. So every time people like laymen like me, we are confused. Some people say this, other people say the other. And listening to the ambassador as well, I said when he said that small islands don't have a, they shouldn't have the big territory of, uh, um, what do you call this uh, uh, area of uh, maritime, we, we, we agreed with him. He said, if it's a small island, why should it have so much there? And then I asked Andreas, is this correct? Why? And he said, it's according to the international law. It needs some negotiations to, to sort it out. So we are so confused with these reasons and, and analysis of failures and this. So there must be other, other reasons of failing to, to find the solution. So what do we, we there are small communities in, the, in, the, in Cyprus, not only Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots. We are Maronites, we are Armenians, we have this. So the, the thing is, please try to find the solution. <laughs> because otherwise, not only will fail, but some communities will disappear. For example, the Maronite community is in a very difficult position. We have our villages on this side, we have our people on the other side. So what, what will happen to, this, uh, to our community? So the, the sooner we have a, a solution, the better chances of surviving we'll have. So what we do, we, we request, we beg, so that you sit down and you find a, a solution to the Cyprus problem as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK. First of all, thank you for that most stimulating discussion. The reason why we have failed to solve the Cyprus problem, from my perspective, has been due to the, uh, the, the nature of the status quo that has been strengthening the constituency of skeptics, people against the solution, people who are more focused on their personal uh, ambitions than what's in the greater interest of Cyprus. And in order to enhance simultaneous political will, we need to uh, attempt an evolutionary approach, as you have all stated quite rightly. I happen to be amongst those who strongly support uh, a bottom-up approach uh, that you have all stated in your interventions. However, in the case of Cyprus, the first and foremost is to sign a strategic political agreement on the basis of the UN resolutions and parameters, on the basis of the extent of the negotiations so far, which is Crown Montana, and on the extent of all the convergences that have been reached by Crown Montana, not to be subjected to negotiation and not to be taken to another ride, if you like. Such a strategic political agreement must have a time frame, something that the Greek Cypriot leaderships have all been very, very reluctant to accept so far. Unless a time frame is attached to a political agreement, it will not enhance the simultaneous will that is a prerequisite of a conclusive process. Secondly, all the CBMs that you have all stated are going to be undoubtedly very instrumental uh, in order to encourage and incentivize the two communities for a federal partnership. However, these 
must be implemented within the framework of that strategic political agreement in order to abandon the likelihood of creating a new status quo on the island. On the opposite, we should aim, we must aim to create an environment conducive to a federal partnership, a an environment that will abandon all the fears, all the skepticism towards a federal partnership. And the, the one that, in my opinion, will have the biggest impact, again, as most of you have addressed already, is to find a mutually, an all-party acceptable way on the basis of UNCLOS, the, the uh, Convention of the Law of the Seas, uh, to realize the Eurasia interconnector as well as the undersea natural gas pipeline to set off from Israel and go to Turkey via Cyprus. That will have the largest impact. It will have the largest impact for political will as well as for the uh, confidence that we're trying to, confidence and incentive that we're trying to enhance at the community level. Uh, that's uh, the, the humble contribution that I felt obliged to make. Thank you all again, once again. Thank you so much. Now, in today's panel, we uh, discussed with our panelists, uh, our panelists mentioned uh, about the negotiations, how the negotiation, new negotiation process should be carried out by the Turkish side and also the importance of the regional uh, actors, energy regional cooperation in the eastern uh, Mediterranean and also the perspective uh, of Turkey and Greece foreign policies on the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, I would like to thank you for our distinguished speakers uh, for their valuable contributions and also thank you for our participants for the taking part in our event and also of course I would like to thank you uh, Merit Royal Diamond Hotel which is the sponsor of our organization thank you for joining us today Yeah.